Welcome to Newsbreak Chats. I'm Chai Hofilenia, the editor of Newsbreak, the investigative and in-depth section of Rappler. Matatapos na ang Agosto. Ito ang tinatawag na Ghost Month, and it's time to review and dissect the big stories that broke this month. Today, we will be talking about the law and some controversial figures whose names you probably are already familiar with by now. Si Bicoy, Ronald Cardema, and lately, Antonio Sanchez. Makakasama natin sa ating discussion si na Sofia Tomacruz, who covers the Comelec, the Comelec among many others. <laughs> and kasama rin niya si Rambo Talabong, who also covers the police and many others. And uh, si Lian Buan, who is our justice reporter. And malawak din ang sakop ng justice when we say it's the justice speed. Uh, siguro let's, let's jump in and um, start the discussion and talk about Bicoy. Um, his, his full name, his formal name really, is Peter Jomel Advincola, and he's a former seminarian, seminarian. if I remember correctly. Um, and he submitted several affidavits, affidavits, different versions to different government agencies and organizations. And Rambo and Dian, I think you looked at all these all these affidavits and what did you find? Okay, so when we talk about Mikoy, unang pumapasok sa isip natin yung lalaking nasa video na nag-viral noong April mm -hmm. na inaakusahan si President Duterte at saka yung malalapit sa kanyang mga tao of drug involvement. Tapos months onward, up to now, paiba-iba siya. So nag-flip-flop siya ng allegiance. Mm -hmm. So sinasabi niya si Pangulong Duterte involved sa drugs. Tapos Ngayon, sinasabi niya yung kanyang paglalabas ng akusasyong yun ay galing sa Liberal Party at saka sa opposition candidates ng Otso Diretso noong last election. Pero bago pa yun, naglabas siya at nagpasa siya ng mga affidavit sa gobyerno kay Senator Tito Soto, Senate President. Nagpasa siya na inaakusahan naman si President Aquino, si Senator Laila de Lima, nung kainita nung drug hearings against Senator Laila de Lima. So, ilang affidavits lahat-lahat ang Bale, nakita niyo? Apat, no? Lian, yeah. Apat na affidavits lahat-lahat. Allegiance niya kay President Duterte una, mm -hmm. ac accusing Senator Laila de Lima, and then accusing the administration, and then accusing again the LP. The opposition. The opposition. Mm -hmm. Dalawa yung version na nakita namin na inaakusahan niyang opposition. So, yun, naisip namin gumawa ng story ha, na ipakita yung glaring inconsistencies sa kanyang, not only with the details, but also with his allegiance, kung ano man yung convenient sa kanya. Uh, roughly ilang pages, lahat-lahat yun? Yung two, first two affidavits niya, which talks about the supposed underground room in Mississippi's Bay, mga seven pages each. Mm -hmm. So two affidavits is like 140 pages. Mm -hmm. And then the, the last two affidavits, isa lang naman yung content na it's it's accusing the opposition pero there's a version which he submitted to the CIDG and then there's the version which they submitted to the DOJ mga around 40 50 yon so naglalarong 200 pages yung 200 pages lahat na tulungan ninyong dalawa tapos yeah. different dialects pa na maybe yes, uh, pa. may bicolan yung first two is bicolano because he's from Albay okay what prompted you to look at the affidavits and to compare the documents I guess it's because nung lumabas, nung nag-surface si Bicoy, dun na kasi tayo naguluhan lahat because at first it was clear to us that he's Bicoy, the hooded man who's accusing the Duterte administration of drug links. And then Senator Soto came forward and said, oh, you know what, nung 2016, it was Aquino who he was accusing. And then bigla siyang pumunta sa IBP, he wanted to sue Paolo Duterte and Bongo. And then he surfaced a week later at the PNP hosted by Camp Rame to accuse the opposition. So parang, bakit ang gulo-gulo mo? Parang ganun. So we wanted to track his first words <gasps> up until his last word. Okay. Uh, uh, to Sige. add to that, um, actually, we discussed na rin tayo dito na it came to a point na inaakusahan na niya ang second highest official of this country, VP Lenny Robredo. Sinasabihin niya na mayroon siyang conspiracy against Duterte. So it's like accusing the vice president of committing coup d'etat against the president. But See, prior to that, sa video niya, sa video niya, the president naman. Kasi natin pangulo naman ang nagkasabutan sa buong bansa. So, kagulo na rin yung iniisip ng mga tao at that point. And I like how Rambo worded it na in all of these flip-flops, he makes it a point to save himself. So parang siya lang yung laging walang kasalanan. So who is this person and bakit siya nakapanggulo sa oposisyon at sa gobyerno ng ganito kalaking magnitude? That's why we were interested. Rambo, you spoke with him, di ba? Yes. Na-interview mo siya. What mm -hmm. were your impressions of this man? Well, 
um, nung nakausap ko si Bicoy, he seemed like he's a former seminarian. So talagang pinakit siya yung sarili niya na parang mahilig talaga siya pumunta sa simbahan. Kasi nakaano siya eh, overall talaga siya mukhang sakristan yung naka-dark blue na polo barong na, gan- na short sleeves. Tapos meron siya malaking cross, wooden cross na nakapatong sa kanyang Isang chest. Isang ko sa props? I think props talaga <laughs> yun eh. Tapos kung tinatanong mo siya ng mga detalye, magaling siya magbigay ng detalye. Pero parang memor- uh, memorisado talaga niya. Kabisado, kabisado niya yung mga detalye halimbawa sa drugs. Sasabihin niya na ito ang kanyang pin number, ito ang ito ang drug group dito sa Bicol, ito yung quadrangle group. Kabisado, kabisado niya alam mo para nag oral recitation sa pero kung tinulak mo pa sa dun sa mga ibang bagay na hindi niya memorisado. Um, for example, sino pa ang ibang makakapagsabi ng sinasabi mo? Wala siyang masabi ko sino iba pang makakapagsabi. So, walang corroboration. Okay, walang corroboration. Tapos, meron ka bang mga dokumento ng legitimate banks? For example, PNB or BPR. Real banks, hindi lang yung spreadsheets na binibigyan niya. It will come in time, sasabihin niya. So, at that point, iniisip ko na, parang hmm, hindi ito seryoso kasi ang dami niya sinasabi, pero wala naman talagang pinagbabasehan. Parang, at most, testimony. Pero testimony lang niya. And the best way to actually prove a testimony is to find other people with the same testimony. testimony. Pero wala rin siyang maibigay na gano'n. Okay. Uh, because pinag-aralan nyo yung four, four affidavits at um, tinignan nyo, I guess, you compared, no? Uh, what were the most glaring things that stood out? Either inconsistencies yeah. or lies ba? Did they come across as lies? Yung first two, which talks about the quadrangle group, Inamin niya naman ito eh, because when he pledged allegiance kumbaga, to the Duterte administration, niretrack niya na that everything he said about a quadrangle group in Misibis Bay was a lie. And that's a big flip-flop kasi from accusing Aquino and then you accuse Duterte, so flip-flop siya. Tapos yung two last affidavits niya, meron siyang mga slip. Like for example, the first time he met Senator Antonio Trillanes, in the first affidavit he said, Antonio Trillanes was there at the resi- bishop's residence in Caloocan with Bishop Ambo David. The second affidavit, sabi niya, hindi tumawag lang si Senator Trillanes kay Father Alejo through Proton Mail. And we've noted, we've pointed out that Proton Mail doesn't have a call feature. It's a secure emailing service. And then the next is, he at- alleged that Ocho Derecho with VP Robredo and him all met inside Ateneo on March 4, which happened to be our senatorial right. ser- yes. senatorial forum. So we were all there. We were all there. So the candidates were really there. So sabi, sabi niya doon sa first affidavit, VP Lenny Robredo joined the meeting. The next affidavit sabi niya, he ju- she just dropped by for five minutes. So may mga ganun siyang inconsistency. Pero para sa akin, what is most interesting to me is yung dalawang Misibis Bay affidavit niya. Kasi nung pinapaamin siya ng PNP na nagsinungaling ka, di ba? Nagsinungaling ka. Saan mo nakuha yung mga details? Parang saan mo nakuha yung mga purported documents? Sabi niya, isinubo sa akin ng mga taga for habang nasa loob ako ng binibig. So parang for me, that's a red flag na meron talagang nangyaring campaign against the Lima in 2016. And I guess if investigators are really sincere in, in, in going to the bottom of this, is investigahan nyo sino ba yung mga nakasama niya sa binibig? Saan nang galing tong mga documents niya? So what could be the motivation for this guy? Um, Sinong meron bang uh, person or people or group yeah. behind him? I think as we mentioned earlier, it's really about self-preservation. And for him to, of course, gain money and access. Actually, the first description of PNP about him is he was, or he still is, an information peddler. So an information peddler fabricates information, sells it, even the delivery of it. As in, to make it appear na alam niya kung ano sinasabi niya. At para magamit siya para sa kaso, kaya niya magsalita. And for me, yung pinaka-striking sa akin is how he can actually say repeatedly, mm-hmm. paulit-ulit, at the end of all of his testimonies, itong sinasabi ko, itinataya ko sa ito, itinataya ko sa Diyos, mm-hmm. ito yung aking panalangan talaga, alam ko malinis ako. Paulit-ulit yung sinasabi yun, I think it takes a certain kind of person mm-hmm. to say that repeatedly even if everything he's saying is already contradicting himself. And nasa ang stage na ba? Uh, in terms of investigation, siniseryoso ba ng gobyerno si Bicoy? Well, the Department of Justice really, ha- well, 
Yes, because it was the PNP CIDG which filed the complaint. So it was the government which filed the complaint. It was not a private complaint. Sa part naman ng Department of Justice, wala naman kasi silang choice eh. Kasi pag dumating ang complaint sa kanila, they really have to to launch a preliminary investigation. So, so part of due yeah, it's part of due process. So there's going to be a next hearing on September 6. Kaka first hearing lang uh, last two weeks ago. Uh, so you think this will proceed? Kano katagal to? The scenarios ka ba na nakikita? Feeling ko magtatagal because there are 36 complainants. Ah, uh, 36 respondents. So imagine, imagine a case of four respondents. Ah, four respondents. Kapag nag-file ng motion yung isa, tatagal yan ng 15 days. Sasagot yung prosecution ng 15 days. Sasagot na naman yung... And so then, if you do the math... If you do the math and do that in cycle for 36, uh, 36 respondents, eh, tatagal talaga to ng tatagal. Abuti ng taon? Depende siguro sa will ng... Kasi the prosecutor can always say, okay, stop na ang motion nyo. I will, I will resolve this now. But what we saw last, uh, the last hearing is, binibigyan talaga ng pagkakataon ng prosecutor lahat ng respondents to be able to file all the pleadings that they want to file. But how do you explain this, di ba? Parang din na... Um, hindi siya binigyan ng importansya ni Senator Soto. And then merong inconsistencies that you saw, which for sure, even... The, the investigators and the prosecutors should have should have seen by themselves. Pero why give this due course just because there was a, a complaint lodged with the OJ? Tenon ba yun? Feeling ko in the bigger scheme of things, it falls squarely into the narrative of the administration that the opposition is trying to bring down the Duterte government. Because inciting to sedition before Duterte, it was like. It was unheard of kasi hindi naman natin alam yun eh. And then pagdating ng Duterte administration, Trillanes already faced like two complaints of inciting to sedition. A webmaster has faced a complaint for inciting to sedition. Now, sila naman. So parang di ba ang narrative ng Duterte administration is pinapabagsak kami ng opposition. So here comes a witness who is willing to say everything that will complement that narrative. And I guess they took that opportunity. And about penalty for inciting to sedition? Six years, sorry. Six years. Six years. Buti na lang, Rambo. Hindi ka nasama doon. Hindi ka nandito sa liyo. Okay. Another another interesting case involves Ronald Cardema. Um, siya naman, meron din siyang sariling narrative. And he insists that despite his age of 34, he should be considered youth and be uh, a youth representative. Um, Sophia, I, I don't know if you've spoken to him or if you've studied him very closely, you've followed him. Can you tell us a little bit more about him and how do you explain this lying? Right, well, what we see when it comes to Ronald Kadame is he was virtually unknown before the Duterte administration. Mm. He came into the spotlight because he was this leader of the Duterte youth, staunch defenders of the president, had pictures of him with the yeah. fist and everything. So he's quite close to the president? Well, he likes to make it appear that way at the yeah. very least. Okay. Um, I don't know why he insists on saying that he's qualified, but what we do know is um, the rules are very clear. The law says that you can't be a youth representative unless you're 25, at least 25 years old to 30 years old by election day. And Kardama isn't even a few months above 30 or something. He's four years mm -hmm. above the age limit. He's 34 years old. And that's what the Comelec, um used as its biggest, I guess, argument, the heaviest argument to disqualify him. Mm -hmm. um, his nomination is that no matter how you put it, you can't change the fact that you weren't born, um, you, that you don't meet the age limit. Unless you change the birth certificate. As a uh, Comelec commissioner, Wanda Guanson said, he can't, like, as much as he wants, he can't turn back time, go into, back into his mother's womb and be born <laughs> later. That's what, he, that's, what she, that's, that's how she put it. So, it's very gutsy. Lady. It's interesting, to, yeah, it's interesting to look into why he might be so insistent on, on um, getting that seat in Congress. Maybe you've reached the point of no return in the sense you've gone this far. Just, I don't know, <laughs> stick to your guns, yeah. But he was chairman of the National Youth Commission. But he was already chairman of the National Youth Commission, which is also why a lot of uh, lawmakers, other lawmakers, were saying, "Why would you? You already had a position. Why did you suddenly want to go for Congress instead?" But 
we can talk about his motivations and why he might be so gun on taking a seat in Congress, but it doesn't remove or doesn't um, what stays the same is the fact that the rules are very clear. Uh, there are limitations, there are qualifications, and you don't meet it. So why so brazen? I mean, if the rules are so clear, uh, walang debate, mm -hmm. and he insists. Well, the way that why he... so brazen? <laughs> it was interesting to, I'm, I, I suppose that when you look at this guy, when you see his history, also, yeah, um, he's a very driven person. Mm -hmm. um, even in his policies when he was National Youth Commission Chair, it was uh, it made headlines for how aggressive it was and everything. So I guess it's this is the kind of guy who I mean, once he sets his mind on a certain position he's very much in it. And so and so when it comes to and we see that in how he's argued his position saying, okay, fine, I can't argue the fact that I'm 34 years old, but I will say that I don't represent the youth. I yeah. don't represent the youth, I represent the professionals. And of course, Kovalec says, no, 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 no. Your registration says youth. So, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to look into him more personally and see what motivates him. Okay, in terms of process, mm -hmm. Kovalec, um, ano ba yung mangyayari? I know that there have been complaints, um, against his nomination as party list representative. Um, right. What's next? Where the case, where Cardamas case is at now, is he appealed for the Comelec and Bank to reconsider his cancellation, the cancellation of his nomination. A lot of people are wary and ask the public to be vigilant about that because if we go by track record, people are saying it looks like the Comelec has a soft spot, the end Bank has a soft spot for him. We've seen that decisions that have been made have been made against the 30 youth on lower levels and then when it reaches the end bank it seems to flip so right now his his cancellation is up for reconsideration but at the same time i think it's also important to note that it stays with the comelec because one thing he's argued is that it should be under the jurisdiction of the house of representatives already because the 30 youth want a seat mm -hmm. and everything but then Election lawyers and election experts have said no, it still stays with the Comelec procedure procedure wise because you haven't been issued a certificate of proclamation which you need to be considered um, officially part of the House of Representatives. And they withheld that. And but the but the end bank will have to convene, mm -hmm. bayon, and then they will have to find to um, to issue the final decision. Yeah, the or may mga appeal appeal pa bayan. Oh after that, um, according to Guanzan, she suspects that the the fact that he's overage will weigh heavily on the end bank's decision because this is something that it's so black and white um but after that she su supposes that um because it would have been already disqualified let's say in that level what comes next is the 30th itself its registration as a party that might be up for question afterwards why the bashang e blacklist or or to cancel because cancel. it would be then? canceling. Yeah. If somebody a files a if somebody okay. files a petition to cancel the Dirty Youth's nomination uh party list registration. Okay. Um, let's go to Guanzo, no? Commissioner mm -hmm. Guanzo. She's a very colorful lady, mm -hmm. um, very aggressive on, on Twitter and she went um, hitting at Cardema oh, yeah. uh, Cardema himself. And some people have criticized her for it. Right. Do you think she went overboard naman in, in hitting him and you know, trying to defend herself, I guess, against his accusations? We had Comlet Gwans on here no, in the rapper studio last week and we asked her that question. Don't you think, how would you respond to people who were saying you might be being too vocal for a, for a commissioner who is involved in the decision, the case of Ronald Cardem? And she says, as far as I'm concerned, there's no rule stopping me from speaking out. She says, in fact, it is my duty mm -hmm. to speak out and defend the Comelec because there's this person who is attacking our integrity and saying that us commissioners can be bribed, can be bought, and what does that say mm -hmm. for the kind of democracy we will produce? So as far as I'm concerned, I'm only doing my duty to defend the commission. 
So I think that if we were to take it on that, on what she said, according to the rules, let's say of the commission, sure, she may be pushing it a little, but mm-hmm. she's staying within her limits. So within the legal bounds. Yeah, within the end. legal bounds. Some may argue it's a little bit unnecessary, let's say, the back and forth, the social media, um, word war. Yeah. But, I mean, she's not inhibiting. She's made that for sure. I have a question for Sophia. Is there yeah. any Kabbalic commissioner who comes close to Guanzon when it comes to boldness? Actually, I don't think so. When you put her beside her peers, she oh. even said to herself, I'm such a big personality, you can't control me. And that's something that we've seen even prior to this administration, let's say. She's always been an independent voice in the Comelec, even during the Kiel administration. So she said, yeah, she's, I don't think anyone can compare to, to her and her personality. Mm-hmm. Not even the Comelec chair. Not even the Comelec chair. He's I mean, quiet. I mean, if you talk about defending the, the institution, mm-hmm. it should be the chair who should be at the forefront of it. Right. Pero quiet siya dito. Yeah. It's really Guanzan who is the face of this issue. The face of the commission in this issue. So you think it would be kind of weird if the Comelec decides in his favor? I wouldn't see how it could be justified in the sense that the rules are so clear. It's so black and white when it comes to qualifications. It would be interesting to see how they would try to justify it. You know, if they were to suddenly reverse the cancellation of his nomination. So... I don't see how it could be um, voted in his favor. Okay, so we'll continue watching yeah, that, that particular issue. That. Another, another man who's talking about mm-hmm. the rule of law and um, twisting the law, um, Antonio Sanchez, the former, the former mayor of, of Kalawan, who's been um, accused of well, convicted, convicted, actually, convicted of rape and, and murder. murder. Um, he is forgotten, and people expected him to be in jail until, until his last days. Pero bigla siyang nabuhay ulit after more than... 25 years. More than yeah. 25 years, so that's more than two decades. Paano nga ba ito nangyari? I think there's... How did he become relevant again? Mm-hmm. Wala kong maisip na ibang word to describe this fiasco kundi nagkagulo. Mm. Nagkagulo because of a lack of communication between officials of the DOJ and Bucher families. Lack of foresight na ang inclusion ni Sanchez sa listahan would draw this much public outrage. And in the end, they were adjusting day by day. So parang iba-iba na. So how did it happen? In 2013, pinasa yung um, 10, 5, RA 10592 which increased uh, the period of the period by which your sentence can be slashed. So 10592, kung super behaved ka, it can slash your sentence up to half. Kasi imagine in your first to 2 years in prison, kapag behave na behave ka, it can slash 20 days of your one month. So sa isang buwan, 20 days wala na, 10 days na lang yung sinerve mo. And that goes higher as each year passes by. So ganun talaga kalaki yung binigay na chance akong baga ng gobyerno para mag-reform ang isang inmate. But that was perspective in 2013. So meaning, kapag nakulong ka 2012, you cannot avail of the benefits. Okay. So syempre, yung mga human rights lawyer argued for equal protection clause, <coughs> hindi pwedeng 2013 pa mm-hmm. beyond lang. So in July this year, July 2019, the Supreme Court unanimously declared that the law shall be applied retroactively. So it implied na yung mga preso nung 1990, kung 40 years yung maximum sentence nila at 25 years na silang nasa kulungan at it can slash your sentence up to half, then dapat by now laya ka na. So isa si Mayor Sanchez doon. So doon I think doon nagmumula yung issue and so much conflict because <coughs> there is a law that would affect roughly 11,000 inmates. Dami nun, eh? Kung wala sanang pangalan yung inmate, baka kaya mong tanggapin. Yes, we believe that uh, in reformative justice, pero dahil nabigyan siya ng, ng mukha na this is a man who uh, the Supreme Court called an unthinking beast, ng rape, pumatay, parang biglang hindi natanggap ng tao na, my God, this law can free this man. So dun nagkagulo, and I think the government 
was not able to sufficiently appease worries or even explain the batas and procedures. Medyo premature by naging announcement. Was it, uh, I'm trying to recall, was it nauna ba si Bucor or nauna si DOJ? Nauna ang DOJ. Nauna ang DOJ. And DOJ said, Benjamin Sanchez, without checking? He was asked because it was in the grapevine for all of Tuesday last week na, uy, makakalaya na daw si Mayor Sanchez. Mm -hmm. Parang, galing yun. So we, he was asked, just the Secretary Menor de Guevara was asked to confirm. And he did confirm. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, he is very likely for really soon due to the law. And it, that was backed by his prison's chief, Bucor Director General Nicanor Feldon. And then, nung nag-backlash, saka sila nagsimulang mag-backpedal na parang, hindi, wait lang, we're reviewing, ah, hindi pala, ay, hindi pala, or now, hindi na pala talaga. Hmm. Tapos, yung isang nababanggit din na in relation to um, the GCTA, Good Conduct Time Allowance, uh, time allowance Law, is, ano to? Uh, CPI, yes. which is the Credit Prevent for preventive for imprisonment. For preventive imprisonment. Ano naman yung CPI na to? So, sobrang, uh, the, the law is too complicated kasi no? So, good conduct time allowance is yung pwede mong credit kapag behave ka. Okay. Good conduct. Credit of preventive imprisonment or CPI. So, for example, si Rambo was charged of murder. Mm. Non-bailable yun. So, kahit hindi pa siya convicted, kukulong ko na siya. Okay. So, let's say, limang taon siyang nakulong kahit hindi pa siya convicted. That's his CPI. Okay. So that will be, ima minus yung five years CPI niya para ma reduce yung sentence. So kung yari 20 years siya, non bailable offense, five years na siyang nakakulong. Five years siyang before, CPI, yeah. Before conviction. 15 years lang siyang mga serve. Ah, okay. So ima minus siya. Ganon. Papano kung murder and rape? So kung murder, that's reclusion perpetua, that's a maximum 40. Kung kinulong siya ng limang taon, 35 na lang yun. On CPI alone, kapag <coughs> good conduct pa, mababawasan pa yun. Okay, so this applies whether or not you committed a heinous crime. Doon nagkakagulo ang lahat ng tao. <coughs> As it, gulong-gulo ng mga... Because in the first part of RA 10592, it talks about CPI. Mm -hmm. And it says that if you are a person charged with a heinous crime, then you should not be qualified for a CPI. Okay. So, sabi ng ibang lawyer, heinous crimes is only excluded sa CPI. It does not exclude you from GCTA because they are two different things. Mm -hmm. Pero pagdating sa provision ng, ng GCTA, dito na nagkakagulo, kasi there are the sentence has two parts. The first part is, every person qualified for CPI shall avail of GCTA. So for Secretary Menardo Guevara, if you're not qualified for CPI, then you should not be qualified for GCTA. Because the sentence is, a person qualified for CPI shall avail of GCTA. Mm -hmm. Pero may second, may semicolon <laughs> sa law. It says, or any person convicted in any penal colony. Okay. So, meron siyang or. <laughs> so, tinanong namin si Secretary, sabi ko namin, Secretary, there's a second class of people in the law. Uh -oh. And Sanchez falls in that second class. Actually, every prisoner falls in that second class. Okay. Eh, sabi niya daw, a basic rule in statutory construction, the, the, the specific prevails over the general. And specific yung nauna. Specific yung nauna. Pero, sa IRR, na pinoblish ni Dalima at ni Mar Rojas, that or became an end. So, any person qualified for CPI may avail of GCTA and any person convicted in a penal colony. So, this is, it's all prisoners. So, yeah, all encompassing. Yes, all encompassing. Therefore, Sanchez can qualify. Yes, can qualify. And in fact, the BUCO revealed today that nung pinasa yung law nung 2013, they've already freed 1,914 heinous crimes inmates. So, may 1,914 inmates na nanakalaya. So, if Duterte and Guevara insist in excluding heinous crimes from the GCTA law, anong gagawin nila sa 1,914 na nanakalabas na? Nakalabas na. na. So, pababalikin ba nila yun ng bilibid? Magulo nga ito. Magulo siya. Magulo siya. Um, there are some who've argued naman na this, itong kaguluhan na to is really also a way to make a case for the reimposition of the death penalty. Do you agree? Tama ba? 
tap mo reading na yon or is this a bit of a stretch? Yun yung speculation ni Senator Laila de Lima that the government manufactured it para lang magdrum up ng support for death penalty. Pwede niyang isipin yun. I don't, I mean, I, I can't say if ganun yung naging, kasi from my point of view, I just felt that it was a lack of foresight na magig, naging ganito yung magiging reaction ng mga tao and a lack of organization between Bucor and DOJ because obviously hindi sila nag-uusap <coughs> na parang may ginagawa yung Bucor na isang may ginagawa yung DOJ. Na I mean, how could Guevara not know na meron na palang 2,000 prisoners to release? In the same way, na halimbawa, in the case of Bicoy, yes. alam nito ni Senator Soto, tapos yeah, merong ba? ng police si IDG. Question for Lian. Mm. Sa, so, in this tangle of law, IRR, everything, ano yeah. yung pinaka-effective na way to untangle this? Ano yung recourse na pwede ka? Yung IRR ba? O bagong batas ba? I think, sobrang emotional lang kasi yung mga tao towards Mayor Sanchez. Eh. They said, oh, you should disqualify Mayor Sanchez because he committed a heinous crime. If you disqualify one, you disqualify everyone else, everyone who, may else be who may be deserving. So, and it, it, it defeats the intent of the law that every person can reform inside prison. Ngayon, kung tanggap mo yan, then go. Pero marami atang hindi kayang sikmurain na kapag in natin to everyone, it will apply also on one man such as Mayor Sanchez. For me, uh, I agree with the proposal of Senator De Lima that there should be a disqualifying act from GCTA. Sabi niya, kapag nag-commit ka ng criminal offense sa jail, which, criminal, hindi to ano lang, ay, hindi lang siya misdemeanor, kasi misdemeanor can be, nakalagay kasi sa guideline, pag, kapag nag-talkback ka sa prison, sa, uh, pag nag-talkback ka sa warden mo, ano na yun eh, demerit na yun. That's not a criminal offense. If you committed a criminal offense inside prison, like say, stashing drugs, mm. That's RA-9165. Dapat disqualify ka na ever. Which Sanchez has been accused yeah, of. Which Sanchez diba? has been accused of. The, the wisdom of that is, para hindi on and off yung good conduct. Hindi naman so pwedeng, dapat. I'll be good today, pero I'll be bad next month. Kasi anyway, next month lang naman yan. Ganun. So dapat, sustain good behavior. Okay. Um, sige, siguro just a few more last questions before we, we wind up. So, anong take away nyo from, from these stories? We have three different cases involving um, following the law, essentially, pero parang consistently we're seeing na parang hindi nasusunod. Sophia, what's your take away from this? I think my take away from this is, you know, the laws are there for a reason. Yeah. In the sense that, for example, the GCTA, it's there to give prisoners who have reformed inside jail a chance to uh, get out and be free again. The way Comelec has its own rules in place to give way to candidates who need those situations where they have they need someone to substitute for them. So my takeaway from this is I don't know, how do we make those laws serve the people that they really are meant to serve? Or how do you make it more just, more equal for those for everyone really under the law? And I don't know, it's a it's a it's a continuing question I think and it's interesting to see how um, it takes really extreme cases mm -hmm. to highlight those gaps in the law or to highlight those, those loopholes in the law that you see can be exploited by, like we say, the most extreme cases. Kasi nga, di ba, kanina, before, before we started the, um, this, no? we, were, we were discussing, sabi natin, it would be good to find uh, a case or a prisoner who is a model prisoner and who who should benefit from, from And I'm the sure law. there are many. Yeah. yeah. Malas lang na si Sanchez yung pinamukha eh. To, wrong person. Yeah. Wrong person siguro, di ba? Okay, how about you, Rambo? Um, for me, I guess, ang problema dito, nakikita ko dun sa across the issues that we tackle today is how the law is so misunderstood in so many levels. Kasi yung kay Bicoy, oh, magkalabas si Bicoy, sasabihin lang ng mga tao, ay, nagkakalat siya, ah, si Paul Duterte ba talaga involved sa drugs? Ay, hindi pala yung, yung ano pala, yung opposition pala ang ano, kontrabida dito. At saka sila ang nagkukulita o nagsesedisyon sa gobyerno. 
Tapos dito naman kay Sanchez, malalaman nilang, na lang nila bigla na, ay lalabas ni Mayor Sanchez, pero hindi nila iniintindi. <coughs> hindi nila binubusisi talaga yung batas. Kasi nakapasa na to 2013 pa lang, tapos meron na palang IR, IRR. Tapos hindi alam na mga tao. So, yung ang nangyayari, too little, too late na lang yung rest back ba? Yung feeling of anger ng mga tao. Kaya I think it's really important na merong explainers na nilalabas ang rappler dito sa law para at least makahabol sila kung ano nangyayari sa batas. Yeah. My takeaway is that really sometimes your emotion get the better of you. Because, kasi I can admit, when I learned that Mayor Sanchez was gonna be freed, I was livid. Kasi, yes. di ba, I mean, that crime, my God. Pero when you sit on it and you sleep on it and you realize that this law doesn't affect only one person, it will affect roughly 11,000 people. And I think that's the thing that people should accept about the law. It's equality of all. So in the same way as criminals should be given due process, as well as victims should be given due process. There's really an equality of law. So kung ayaw mong i-apply yung law sa isang tao dahil masama siya, you have to be prepared na hindi siya ma-apply sa isang taong mabuti. Correct. Mahirap siyang okay. sikmurain, pero that's really the law. So I parang, think key yung sinabi mo kanina eh, that it has to be sustained good behavior. Kasi kung merong ganon for a, for a period of time and consistent, then clearly, that person shows hope, di ba? Yeah. Pwede mo siyang palayayan and give that person a second chance. Um, last question. Kung you're, you're working on three different cases and, and stories, meron ba kayong follow-up stories na ini-imagine na gusto niyong gawin? Hindi ko kayo sisingilin, <laughs> proud. <laughs> si Lian, meron po kayo. <laughs> Yun nga, Ma'am Chai, I, I guess it would be good to find the antidote to Mayor Sanchez. But then again, that's, a, that's an emotional approach mm -hmm. to what should be a legal view. But that's my bias as, as a justice beat reporter. Mm -hmm. Parang, kasi mas gusto kong pag-usapan ng batas kaysa emotion or something like that. But it would be, it would be good to find, to find these people just to, show, just to show the public that meron namang makikinabang talaga na tama na it will be applied it will, uh, deserving people deserve free freedom and we should not deprive them of that just because of one yeah i think okay. sige sa akin follow up kay Lian interesado sa interesado ako dun sa nagpalabas na pala yung gobyerno ng 1900 plus yeah. na may commit ng heinous crimes tapos yun um, sino pa yung iba na controversial mm -hmm. sa tingin ko kasi yun yung mga kailangan Kung, kung pwede mong pigilan ba kung nag-commit sila ng crime sa loob, dapat hindi talaga sila makalabas. Kasi napakasakit nito para sa mga pamilyang kanilang kinuna ng buhay ng anak at saka ng mga relatives. Tapos makakalaya lang sila kasi hindi naging mabusisi ang media. Sige. I think for me, um, interesting din to look at the kind of people who take advantage of these laws. So if I were to relate it to Cardema, who is just trying to learn better who he is, what motivates him, what what drives people to push the boundary of these laws. Because, like Leon said, it can take away, you become the face of that, that law and it takes away from the fact that, you know, this law is supposed to serve deserving people as well. Right. Okay, thank you very much for, for your insights and telling us the stories behind uh, these stories that you've been following. Um, hopefully, this has been a very um, enlightening discussion and um, gives us also insight into the, the need for the equal application of the law. And siguro yung need then to, for our government officials no, to, to really scrutinize and study the legal system and daming loopholes and daming gaps so that fair to, to everyone. This has been Chai Hofilenia. Thank you for joining us at Newsbreak Chats.